Welcome folks to Expression 1. What I'm going to do today is show you how to get around the inside of Moodle and also how to um, go through Chapter 1. I'm going to lecture on Chapter 1 for Expression 1. The first thing you'll need to do is log into Moodle. Once you're in Moodle, you can scroll down until you see where it says Online Curriculum. Now, the basic course flow where we have Read the Chapter Material Online, this is what I'm talking about when I say Chapter Material. It's the material found in the Online Curriculum. The chapter notes, lesson notes, are in the Moodle course itself, down at here in section three. And in each one of these, you can expand them and you'll be able to see chapter notes about what each chapter is about. You can move through this. And there's a study guide that has actual questions that you can go and look at in order to prepare you for the test for each individual chapter. So those are there inside of Moodle. The other item is, obviously if it says listening to my riveting lectures, uh, these will be the lectures I am posting now and creating for you that you will be able to see uh, inside of Moodle that are Camtasia videos. Um, last but not least, you have to do any associated labs. These labs will be completed in our NetLabs um, system, which I will create a video to show you how to use NetLabs. I'll create you a NetLabs account that has the same name as your Moodle account and also which you can then give it the same password as your account that you use to get into Moodle. And last but not least, you'll have to log into the cisco.netacad.net site and complete the chapter test for each individual chapter. So let's begin by logging into the curriculum. Okay, I've already logged in uh, earlier so it saved the password. If not, I would have been prompted. The username is Cisco1 and the password is Superman. So click there and put those in. I'm going to go to chapter 1. And we're going to start with chapter one, which does not have a test in the cisco.netacad.net site. But one thing I like to do is I like to explain to people that each one of these chapters has the same format in terms of the way the overall structure is in the, on the Cisco uh, curriculum. One is when you click forward and back, it obviously changes panes in, for you on the particular chapter. You'll notice that each individual page is numbered. This is section one of chapter one, 1.0.1. There are videos that are included inside of each one of the chapters. Welcome. Welcome this to is, the as you day. can tell, this is almost directly off of the Cisco uh, advertisement that you've seen on TV before. But the neat thing about it is uh, each one of these chapters also has other items in it. For instance, pictures, okay, hands-on labs that you can do. Um, later on, there'll be actually moving uh, flash animations. But this right here, I'll, I'll show you in 113. This is something a lot of students don't realize. You've got your text on the left side, but the right side also has text, and it changes with the different items that you click. Okay, so make sure as you're reading the curriculum inside the Cisco, uh, Cisco site here, our site at Stanley, that you click on these items so that you'll be able to see all the different amounts of text and information that are available. Um, it's very neat. It's uh, a great curriculum for students to use, and it, it kind of uh, allows you to do a lot of things, or it allows the curriculum to do a lot of things obviously you can't do with a book. All right, so I'm going to go back to, and Course Index, by the way, that's where the Course Index is along the bottom. There's a search feature, there's a glossary, uh, there are global tools if you need Packet Tracer, which is really the only global tool we have. Uh, but the big thing is the Course Index. So I'm going to go back, you'll see we have 11 chapters in this particular course. Um, everything from living in a network centric world to configuring and testing your network. For the most part, if you've already got Network Plus, Security Plus, you've been in these courses and you know a little bit about networking, this Exploration 1 is going to be very easy for you. Uh, it's a review of the uh, OSI model, it's a review of basic networking, so a lot of this will be easy for you to do. Now, what I do in this uh, particular course is I actually to go through the curriculum and lecture slide by slide or, or uh, page by page in the curriculum. That's one way to do it. It's not the only way. In your classroom, they're also available in the cisco.netacad.net site on the tools. There are uh, a great number of online uh, PowerPoint presentations that have been created by other instructors. There are PowerPoint presentations that have been created by Cisco for each one of the chapters. The only problem with those is they don't offer the interactivity of the curriculum like this but they do allow you to get through the lecture a little bit quicker. Uh, one of the negatives of walking slide by slide through the uh, curriculum is that it takes a little longer to do the lecture. However, I think it's useful. 
and it's one of the main techniques that I use in my classroom. So uh, just kind of throw that out there. Since this is an instructor class, we need to think about how you're going to deliver this to your students, how it's going to be effective for them. In my classroom, I typically give a, an hour lecture or so on the, on the chapter and then allow the students to do the hands-on labs in class. Uh, for you, you'll watch these lectures, we'll have weekly meetings, and then you will do your labs on NetLabs. So, without further ado, let's get started. We'll go back uh, and go back to the introduction. Okay, we're going to skip the marketing video. All right. Uh, this is just a general discussion of how networks have changed our world. Uh, all you have to do, and this is what I do in my classroom every time I teach this, is I pull out my phone and I say, this okay, is much more powerful than the Apollo space capsules computers. And make sure they realize that just how much the world has changed. Because kids take things for granted today. Uh, well, even young adults, even old people, we do. We take it for granted. Um, so I kind of stress how much technology has really changed the way we work, live, and play, to use a Cisco nomenclature. In your classroom, try to use analogies. Ask folks, what kind of networks do you use? Uh, obviously, they're going to talk about, oh, I'm on the internet, I got Facebook, I got this. Yeah, that's true. Uh, here we mentioned online news, online banking, world news. Um, most of us today consume our news online. We don't watch the news. Um, Traffic conditions, everything now from, uh, we have Android phones, we have iPhones that will actually route you around traffic. That's you know a, a whole new set of, of uh, networks. But even things as simple as, how do you get your power? Your power is a network. There's a series of cables, okay? There's something you need, there's a series of cables, and there's a, a, a transmission medium and a protocol for doing it. So that is a, a network that students can relate to. Water. The water network, okay, that's a, a type of network. So students need to be aware that networks exist in a lot of different ways. This hands-on lab using Google Earth to view the world, I have my students do this lab just to kind of get an idea of, first off, how cool Google Earth is, because some of them haven't played with it before. And then start talking about how students today now are taking virtual field trips. You know, they're going to see the, the, uh, the pyramids in Egypt using Google Earth. Not as good as going there, but a whole lot cheaper and a whole lot safer. Podcasting, instant messaging, weblogs. Ask your students if they use podcasts. Um, ask them if they instant message, which they do. I mean, there's no doubt. Text messaging, WhatsApp. Uh, that's a little app that you can put on your phone, Android phone, that allows you to text for free using just data time. Um, all of these are different ways that networking has affected our lives. This class alone, look at how our way to, our ability to learn has changed. There are a lot of universities now offering online classes for free. Um, I think it was MIT and Harvard offered one last semester, expecting maybe you know a thousand, two thousand students to sign up. Three hundred thousand students signed up for free. So we're looking at a major shift in the way education is taking place throughout the world. So the way we learn courseware, this course, you know, uh, it can be updated much quicker than a book. Having published a couple books, I can tell you, by the time a book comes out, it's outdated. It's just a fact of life. So that's one of the things that, that you can stress. Collaboration, okay, the ability for us to work on things together. This is showing Packet Tracer. Uh, you'll learn as we move through here that Packet Tracer is a program that's used in the academy that you can actually have students working together in a multi-user environment. Even better, you can have them competing against one another in a multi-user environment. In fact, you can even have School A, Stanley Community College, competing against a school in Virginia. Okay, so collaboration. Uh, again, multi-user, uh, packet tracer. Uh, reference, where we can grab references off of all of our devices, tablets, um, you know, iPads, Android tablets, those types of things. Administration, how we can go in and control everything from text message staying the students and uh, ready to do the next lab. Uh, this will be a lot more important when we get into the new academy experience, which is going to be a new, instead of cisco.natacad.net, there will be a new online uh, community that you can use. Here's an example course page. This kind of shows students what, it, what the course is about. Um, this is really getting into how networks support the way we work. Um, I don't think it takes very long for folks to understand what a remote worker is. Um, how a farmer, and I've seen this in Arkansas, I've seen farmers who are big rice farmers, they run a GPS on their tractor and as the tractor goes around, 
based upon the testing in the soil, it puts the correct amount of fertilizer into the soil based upon the testing. And so it acts as the GPS tracks the tractor, keeps up with that, and it allows them to more effectively grow their crops. The way we play, this one's easy for students. Uh, everything from uh, online gaming with Xbox 360 to uh, you know now we have Wi-Fi access on airplanes. We have um, access to all types of entertainment on airplanes. Which, by the way, uh, I know on Delta anyway, one of their planes has got an Android-based operating system for their their seatback entertainment system because I saw it reboot uh, and saw the, the Linux kernel and the Android kernel. Now, what what I always teach my students about networks. And so we need a couple things for a network to exist. First off, we need something to share, something that needs to be shared. Back in the old days, it would be a printer. Uh, laser printers were thousands and thousands of dollars. And so instead of having one for every single corner office that housed a, uh, an administrator, they figured out a way to network them. So something to share. You then need uh, a media or medium. And by that, I say I use media or medium because it could be copper cable. It could be fiber optic cable. Or it could be Wi-Fi, it could be just RF signals, or it could be microwave signals. Some media or medium for the signal to travel across. And then you also need a, uh, a set of rules, okay? And rules are protocols. The example I use is uh, if asking any of my students if they've ever been in the military. If you've been in the military, I have not, but I have a lot of military friends. If you've been in the military, you know there are very, very strict protocols. If your commanding officer comes up and you go, hey, what's up? That's not going to work at all. Okay? Uh, so there's, there's protocols or rules to how you communicate. Um, another example I use for uh, protocols are languages. You know, if I say, huh? The rising inflection at the end of huh actually means it's a question. And that is true in most languages that are based um, upon Latin. But most of the languages that we have, uh, especially English, uh, if there's a rising uh, sound at the end of the word, it means it's a question. That's not true in some languages. Chinese is a little different, but that is a common item. So you're going to need okay, a couple things. Again, something to share, a need. You're going to need a media or medium, and you're going to need a set of rules or a protocol in order to do that. Now, this slide here, 122, also discusses that you will need a format. Okay some way of knowing how to get the message from the start point to the end point. The best example here, here really is a, a postcard or a, uh, a mailing address because we know in the U.S. you have the individual that's going to street address, city, zip code. So the zip, state zip code. So the zip code gets it to the correct state uh, and city and then from that inside of that it then goes to the street address which gets it to the correct street and then the number on the street gets it to the correct house, and then from there it goes to the individual in the house. Well, networking is the same way. We have to have a set of rules, the protocols, that determine how we take our information, how we package it, how it gets sent or addressed to the, send, to the receiver from the sender. And really this entire semester is about the OSI model and how we take that information, put it together, and address it so it's sent to the recipient, the recipient takes it all apart, figures out what it is, determines where to pass it to, and does the correct procedure with it depending upon the application it's sent to. Now here's an example of one of our flash-based animations. I'll click play here and you'll see. And this one's pretty cheesy. Uh, we don't charge extra for the flash animations in the curriculum. Some of them are a whole lot better than this. Uh, especially when they start, start showing the actual process of addressing, uh, you know, encapsulating information, de-encapsulating information. But here we have the elements of a network. Now they break it into rules, medium, messages, and devices. Now in my example, messages would be the item to share. Medium or media would be the, uh, the media or medium you send the, the, the messages across. The rules would be the protocols, and then they put in devices because those are the intermediary, intermediary devices that the data travels through in the network. Um, that could be the end host, the sending host, the receiving host, plus all the devices in the middle. Uh, if you read about network theory a lot, a lot of times you will not see the devices listed as an item in the uh, elements of a network. 
you will just see the top four, you know, rules, protocol, or protocols, media, medium, and items to share. But on the Cisco test, uh, for this, well, there's not one for this chapter, but for the, this particular exploration, they do want you to realize there are devices you send things through. Here's some of the, the common symbols. Now, this you do need to stress with your students because they're going to see this over and over in the Cisco curriculum. These are also the logical symbols that are used in most programs like Visio, uh, a lot of online examples. So these are just, hit them quickly, tell them, hey, by the time this class is over, you're going to understand what layer of the OSI model switch works at. You're going to understand what a router is. You're going to understand uh, how these items interact with one another. Here's our different network connections. Okay, so these are the media or mediums, and this goes back to wired networks versus wireless. And please do stress to folks that there are really no true wireless networks. Um, now, I know there are networks like ad hoc networks that are pure wireless, but for the most part, wireless networks are wireless access to a wired network. So, um, important to kind of stress that. Here are the different services and rules. Okay talking about different protocols, HTTP, they've probably seen that, maybe not even know what it is, uh, SMTP, POP, uh, IMAP, um, XMPP, uh, OSCAR, all of these are different protocols you can just kind of go through. Now this is pretty cool. This is actually showing you the steps of sending an innocent message. You type it in, it gets converted to binary bits, transmitted through your uh, NIC, out onto the device, goes through the router, goes across the data network, goes out, and is received. And this shows them the process of how this communication takes place. Then I always say, hey, look, this is just an overview. We're going to show you exactly how the process occurs, or at least a model of how the process occurs. Here we have what we used to have, and this is an interesting item to bring up for, for students because we used to have multiple networks. We used to have a network that carried data, a network that carried voice, a network that carried video. Today, we use converged networks. Everything runs on IP. The video camera I'm taping this on right now could be used for an IP surveillance system. So those exist today. IP signage, the uh, New York Yankees uh, ballpark has Cisco signage in it so that they can, right, if they run out of hot dogs, heaven forbid, they can actually put up, you know, hot dogs are removed, they're no longer there. Uh, if they have a special item that's on the menu, they can change it and put it in. So that allows them to use IP signage. And then this is really a big thing here, intelligent networks. Um, it really is amazing uh, what we're doing with our smartphones, uh, what we're doing with the devices we have. Um, students take it for granted, uh, but i give you a great example. Today in my office, don't tell my boss, but I was watching the Tour de France uh, on Eurovision streaming live from um, you know from from Europe, uh, listening to Sean Kelly, who's an Irish cyclist, who's now a commentator. You know that kind of connectivity um, it, it was just unheard of even 20 years ago. Um, but now today we can stream pretty much anything from anywhere at any time, uh, which is really amazing. And all that is made possible by our networks, um, by these wonderful computer networks that we have designed. And that kind of takes us to here, the network architecture. What do we need to do when we build a network? What are some design considerations? Uh, one is fault tolerance. You know, if you have a, a router go out, if you have a switch go out, you want the network to continue to function. So how do you build your network so that they are fault tolerant? How are they scalable? Okay. One thing I teach people is this. You have 10 computers today, you'll have 50 tomorrow. Uh, computers are like rabbits. You put a bunch of them together, and the next thing you know, you've got thousands of them. Um, always build your networks. I tell my students at least at least six months in the future, preferably a year or more in the future. Um, so if I'm specking out a, a system and the company can afford it, I spec it out so it will meet their needs at least a year in the future, maybe more, depending on uh, what you can do. It's really hard to go much past that with Moore's Law of 18 months. You really can't predict too far into the future of what's going to happen. But scalability, fault tolerance, two major network architecture design considerations that your students need to know about quality of service and security. The quality of service is huge now that we have our converged networks. If it takes a few more seconds for your you know, web page to pop up to tell me uh, what the score on the baseball game is, that's not as important as a real-time transactional program that's going to determine whether or not we make or lose 
a million dollars in the next 30 seconds. Uh, or voice calls. You know, if a voice call is, is the quality of service is poor, you have immediate problems. Whereas if there's, like I said, a slight delay on the web page, that's not a big deal. But for voice, for video, those require quality of service. And when we're running all this information over one network, we have to be able to say, voice calls, video uh, information, they're going to have a higher quality of service than what you see on your data. So that's very important. And then security should be, I mean, I should be without saying, but, you know, uh, the number of people who are having identity theft, the number of people who are, their computers are infected and they're losing information, uh, very important that you stress security to your students. Now, this is the old style networks. It's called circuit switching. Uh, the great example I use here is when you used to see the television shows where they would literally plug, you know, uh, John was calling Mary and they'd put a cable in between the, the operator would. Um, that's really a circuit switch. Uh, it's where you have multiple paths, but really only one path is selected per call. Uh, typically, it's uh, these are, are um, not digital, they're analog, and they, they can be digital too, it doesn't matter. But uh, basically, you create, you make a call, and you create in a circuit switched environment, you create a, a circuit from the initiating host to the end host. And that circuit is used for the entire communication, and then once that communication is over, the circuit gets torn down. Now, all type of stuff about permanent virtual circuits, switch virtual circuits, we could talk about that's later. Um, but the big thing is here with circuit switched, you do establish a connection from the starting host to the end host, all right? Which is very different from what is called packet switch networks, which are what we use in the majority of our networks, to, well, it's what we use in all our networks today. In this case, the sending host takes its information, breaks it into packets, throws it out into the packet switch cloud and says, get it there, using source and destination addresses. You'll notice on this previous slide, okay, there's only one path. So you don't really have to have a lot in the, in the, uh, in the realm of source and destination addresses because the, the, all the procedures are in place to create a full path from the initiating host to the end host, and all information will travel across that. On a packet switch network, we have to have, be able to do a source and destination address. We also need sequence numbers because these large files are broken into little bitty pieces. And when they get to the opposite side, they need to be reassembled in the correct order. So that's packet switching. It's more efficient in most cases. We also, uh, this is kind of a catch-all chapter, by the way. They talk all about different types of Tier 1, Tier 2 ISPs. Um, I think the big thing for folks to realize in this is that Tier 1 ISPs are the big ISPs, the AT&Ts, the Sprints, uh, the governmental agencies that may control large portions of uh, particular areas of the Internet. Tier 2 ISPs border off of those, and then you get local ISPs, uh, which get into the Tier 3 ISPs, which are the small companies. In your area, have a discussion with your students about what are the Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 uh, ISPs in your area. Um, you know, just depends on your local area as to what they will be. And they do show you all the different distribution and how things are set up. So, just kind of a, an overview there. Another slide on quality of service. So, this is our second slide and our third mention of quality of service. So, this is something Cisco stresses uh, is the need for quality of service. Unfortunately, they don't teach you a lot of quality of service in the CCNA. Uh, it's, that's kind of held off for CCMP and for some other items they have in their repertoire. Um, but be aware that video, voice, it needs quality of service. Because as this particular slide says, all traffic is not alike. Data traffic can deal with delay. It can deal, deal with jitter, which is a random delay. It cannot, however, if it is voice or video. It just does not do well with delay. Here's an example of queuing. Okay, This is, again, a, a basic understanding of what quality of service is how we take our information, we apply classification to it, okay, in other words we classify it as high priority, medium priority, or low priority uh, traffic, and with that we can queue it, and as it goes in the router, you give more time to the high priority queue and less to the low priority queue. The only thing you really need to talk about your students here is remember, every, any time your data leaves your network, it leaves your quality of service boundaries you don't have any control over quality of service. So if it's going out over the internet, just because you mark your voice over IP traffic 
as high priority. That doesn't mean your ISP is going to market as high priority. So you need to have a discussion with your ISP or find some way to tunnel your traffic so that your quality of service classifications follow your traffic. Okay. And again, this is a discussion as to why. Okay. Streaming video without quality of service, choppy start and stop. With it, it's clear and continuous. Vital transaction, you'll notice one minute or one second earlier, the price was better by two cents, which could be a huge amount if you buy four million pieces of a certain item. But downloading the page, it takes a little bit later, it's the same exact thing, no difference. And here's a, a short discussion of, of network security, which uh, hopefully, again, we won't have to spend much time with our students about this. But the big thing here is just talk to them about how important network security is, uh, why we need it, uh, some of the governmental regulations as to why we need security. And then we do have a hands-on lab. And one of the, here's the neat things. You can actually click here and pull up the hands-on labs. And this lab has them go to SANS and look at the top 20. Uh, it also has them look at the uh, common vulnerability and exploits library to see uh, some of those. Very good lab for your students to do. And they are in the lab manual for students. And this goes into a little more discussion trends and networks. Where are we going? Uh, obviously, I think this is... Uh, even now outdated because saying increasing demand as increasing reliance services used uh, you know the the recent move by Verizon to give uh, basically bundle all your data uh, is, is really an acceptance of the fact that yes they want to make more money but it's also uh, an acceptance of the fact that that the data is really the service it's not even voice anymore um, our smartphones are more important to us as data devices than they are as telephones uh, which is an interesting change in the way we view our devices. And then there's a little discussion about uh, you know what kind of careers can you expect. This is always a good point to start talking about your students about hey you need to get certifications, you need your degrees, that is true, but you need to look at getting certifications too. Uh, talk about the CCNA, talk about where this these four courses will lead them and how it will prepare them for the CCNA. And then we have our labs, uh, collaboration tools using IRC and instant messaging, which I would like for you to do in Net Labs. And again, I will produce a video for you. This is a July 4th week for us, uh, so it will be a, a short, you know, shortened week for us. Um, but I will produce a video that you can see on how to get into Net Labs. And so I want you to do these these two labs there. And that is the end of Chapter One. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, you can bring them up as we are working on our. Um, on uh, our class discussions.